Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whatever the hell time it is. It's an honor and pleasure. Look at this beautiful scenery we have. <laughs> we got a forklift in the background. This is how a winery actually operates. Luke Taylor here. It's an honor. I'm here with the Catamount's probably most famous alumni. In viticulture, without a question. In plant sciences, actually. You do, ooh, you, ooh, yeah, plant ooh, sciences. It's a big stretch. My yes. mom would probably agree with that. Yes, maybe. <laughs> so we got Matt Dees. I'm here at, uh, I guess, the Hilt Estate. It's uh, being built right now. Mm -hmm. Pretty impressive. I like the bathrooms. Bathrooms are amazing. Yeah. We really built the whole place around the bathrooms. Yes. Yeah. I wish more places would focus on the bathrooms. <laughs> It'd be a better, happier Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, with you. So you've been here since 2000 in a Honada, right? Honada is mm -hmm. part of the Hilton. We'll talk a little bit about that. You've been here since 2004. I have. I showed up when I was 25. I was like this tall when I showed up. How, how tall were you when you were born? <laughs> Inches. Yes. <laughs> just feel like I could put you in my, I feel like I just put you in my pocket. <laughs> no, so, yeah. so you've been here since 2004. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Never wanted to leave. You know, I, or, or let me, let me put this. You were never asked to leave. <laughs> I've never been asked to leave for one. And I also think the greatest winemakers in the world are the people who right, spend enough time at one place, they get to know it. You could spend a whole lifetime in one place and finally start to get an idea on how to do it right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I view this. Marital advice. Thank you. <laughs> right. Marital advice. So tell me a little bit about this property. I mean, tell me about the whole grand scheme of Honada. Yeah, so Honada started in uh, 99. Uh, a, a number of, of folks got together and bought this property here in Ballard Canyon. Actually, it wasn't even Ballard Canyon. Then it was just San Inez. So okay. uh, we bought this, uh, this basically a skinny cattle ranch. I mean, it was 600 acres of sand. And over the years, people have told us, you know, to grow asparagus on it. People have told us, you know, you can't grow grapes. Worst wine pairing, asparagus. It's hard. So they say. It's hard. Mm -hmm. There might be worse, actually. And, and you know you had it the next day, too, which I always love. <laughs> right. It does have a reminding. Yes. A nice, generous reminder. Yes. But, you know, we, so we, we, we basically bought this property that was very unconventional in a very kind of marginal climate and a really kind of untested area in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I think we were really good about being diligent and, and, and kind of trying everything, right? Burgundy didn't go to Pinot and Chard immediately, and, and, and Bordeaux took a long time to really come around to Cabernet Sauvignon, for example. So in the first 20 years in Ballard Canyon... I mean, we're still growing, what are we at now? 17 grapes, something like that? 17 different varieties, mm -hmm. trying to see what works because the sunshine is so pure and warm and the nights are so cold, we're able to ripen everything. That's amazing. Yeah. So how do you get from University of Vermont to California? I mean, that's, that's kind of a long journey by car. Yeah, I actually drove it with my mother once. How'd that awesome go? Awesome. <laughs> Epically good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she drove and you slept in the back. I know how it works. No, no, no. Look, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I did the whole UVM plant soil science department, right? Cool. And then I, I went through and I planted a vineyard with a gentleman back in like 98 and made wine up there, making ice wine and whatnot. And at a certain point, I was ready to get the heck out, man. I mean, like it, it, it was one time when I was basically had a pickaxe and we were digging out through the permafrost to see if any of the buds had survived, right? <laughs> and it was snowing and I was wearing like 19 layers and my eyeballs were freezing open. And I thought, you know, shit, maybe there's somewhere better and easier to make wine. And I can name you multiple places. <laughs> Missouri. New Hampshire, perhaps. Yes, yeah. Missouri. <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with little Casey. There you go. But um, I uh, basically went out in New York at around this time and my brother, who was a banker, and had a little bit more dough than I. I was a you know just college kid scrapping by. Right. Bought me a couple of wines, and one of them was a 1995 Staglin Family Vineyard Cabernet from Rutherford, wow. and fell in love with it. And they made the mistake of of putting their phone number on the back. And I called them and said I'm coming out. And they said we don't have any jobs. And I said well I bought a ticket. And I showed up at the doorstep, <laughs> and they put me in the vineyard with David Abreu's uh, team and Richard Ricardo Villasenor and. Yeah, I was in the right place at the right time, and they're exceptionally wonderful, beautiful people. And Andy Erickson was up there, and wow. he took me under his wing, and I, got, I was the right place, right time. That's crazy. Yeah. They would call you a stalker if you did that nowadays. I know, right? I might have been put in jail. <laughs> exactly. What a difference, yeah. yeah Napa, Ca Na Napa County Police Force makes <laughs> it one arrest a year. It's not for drinking and driving. <laughs> it would have been a different, uh, different story we were talking about. So, now. did I mean, did you? So, what did you do? I mean, pretty much everything. Well, yeah, I started in the vineyard, uh, you know, just pruning and taking care of the vines for the summer, uh, summer 2001. And then I uh, worked with Andy over at Napa Wine Company. They used to make their wines across the street. Mm -hmm. And 
fell in love with the property, the family, the project with Andy, you know, that whole scene um, was just so welcoming and, and so formative to me. They're all really mentors to me. And I've always believed in kind of learning on the job. I love Davis, I love Fresno, I love Cal Poly, but for me, I wanted to find people I really respected in vineyards I really loved and kind of sit at their feet and, and get it figured out that way. Mm -hmm. um, but so I did the whole deal and I worked the 2002 vintage with him up there, worked 2003, and that same time I was going down, down to New Zealand every year. So back and forth and back and forth, just following the sun. Did you do the same thing? I bought a ticket. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a bit tougher. Yeah. No, I did show up in New Zealand not being so great at driving a stick shift. And the guy was like, you can drive a stick shift, right, mate? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, it's left-handed and it's on the column. I'm like, yeah, I'll follow you. You know, yeah, as we're yeah. puttering down the street. But yeah. no, I worked, you know, I got to, you know, really have a mentor in Andy Erickson and a mentor in a guy, uh, uh, the late, great Doug Weiser down in New Zealand. Young man I worked with down there who's one of the greatest winemakers I've ever met. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then, so you, you landed at Honada in 2004. Yeah. So what was it like back then to what it is now? <laughs> I mean, it's still Wild West to me, but back then it was, it was pre-Sideways. Uh, you know, Sideways hadn't come out yet, and Sideways really... Is that that movie about Pinot Noir? It's that movie yeah. about... Yeah, you haven't seen it, Just, right? Yeah, I killed more love, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of Paul, uh, Paul Jim Bada, whatever his name is, and I, I can say that because he probably... What about John Adams? You didn't uh, see the John Adams? Which one's John Adams? No, the movie he did. He did the doc documentary with John oh, Adams. Oh, no. I, I, oh, yeah, he was pretty good in that. It, but the sideways, he was really, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he was I all hear whiny. You. I hear you. And I, he doesn't listen. I can, I can promise you, sure, he's not a, a Cork and Taylor wine podcast <laughs> listener, so I can be honest. <laughs> well, fair. All right, yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it changed shit up. Uh, you know, we used to go to, like, the Hitching Post, right, and get, yep, get a burger three, on yep. Monday night and watch football. And I'd be, like, me at the bar and talking to Frank Steeny, and there'd be, like, three people over here and, like, a, you know, like a sailor drinking over here. And, like, you know, you know it was just this really, like, right. bar scene, right? right? And then I remember a year after Sideways came out, there was a bus of people that came up and got out and, like, literally watched my family and I eat a steak. You know, like, this is what it looks like when someone eats a steak right. at the Hitching Post which is mind blowing, obviously, yeah. uh, really put a stress on my manners. But, you know, I think, I think that kind of explains what happened there for, uh, after around 2004, 2005. Mm -hmm. I think people started to really expand their production. I think the Santa Barbara County region, Santa Rita Hills specifically kind of gained recognition, gained respect, uh, around the United States at least. And, you know, we saw kind of a couple booms and busts with the economy where mm -hmm. people were buying vineyards and developing, and then the economy would kind of check everybody. And, we went through a couple of those cycles, but it's a bit, it's a bit more refined these days, I would say. I think the wines coming out of Santa Barbara County today compared to 2004, they were exceptional then. Mm -hmm. There's just so much new energy now and so much new creativity, and so many of the, the winemakers are really young or are, are winemakers who are legendary and have done their, their time and paid their dues and are still really young at heart and all about adventure and pushing the envelope and like a, like a Brian Babcock who's growing Lamenthia mm -hmm. or, or Adam Tolmack who's growing these crazy varieties now where, that are, 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 are not susceptible to Pierce's disease. Or like, you know, people growing Riesling or people growing Shannon or people pushing the envelope. It's, it's awesome. It's, yeah. a, it's really the Wild West. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think, are you seeing more of a, an uptick of people traveling down here for wine tastings because of that movie? I mean... When people think of, unfor I mean, unfortunately, they think when they think of California, they think of Napa. And, and that's really, you know, oh, yeah. all there is in, in California is Napa. Oh, yeah. I mean, it kind of is. A can it's like the adult uh, Disney, f you know, Disney for adults is Napa to a certain extent, right? I agree. I Like my mom's <clears throat> friends will call and say, you know, we're coming out to California wine country. We'd love to see you. I'm like, well, then rent a car <laughs> and drive seven hours down south. Yeah, and I'm I'll doing that. The thing is, I'm going the other <laughs> way. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But that whole thing cracks me up. It's like, yeah, California wine country. But I think that's changing. Yeah. And Napa does. I mean, Napa, I was saying this earlier today, like has never made better wines than they are right now the wines coming out of Napa right now are so stellar across the board it's it's mind-blowing but I think we're seeing that here in Santa Rita Hills Santa Barbara County Ballard Canyon Happy Canyon we're seeing it in Santa Maria Valley without question we're seeing it uh, in Paso we're seeing it in Santa Lucia we're seeing it and you know you name any region Sonoma Sonoma Coast everybody is is kind of picking up the game a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, rising tides like we're, we're seeing better and better wines and you know, down here is very special to me in the sense that, that like, I, I made one in Napa. Mm -hmm. And Napa's incredible, but what are you going to do? You're going to get Cavalier and, like, we're going to tear out our cab and start growing 
Riesling and Chenin, right? You're not, not going to do that because yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, the financial yep, doesn't. Yeah. Yep. So down here, I love that there's no rules and we've got these incredibly brilliant minds, like these incredible young women, incredible young men, like writing their own rules. Mm -hmm. And it feels like we're the kind of first, second generations kind of defining what's happening here, like kind of figuring out our footing and kind of figuring out what we can do really well here. So it's the most exciting time. Like, you know, talking about Doug Marjoram, like he's been around for a long, long while now. And he's You're calling him old. Ancient. <laughs> no, he's like 23 years old. But, but he's, you know, he's still pushing the envelope again. Mm -hmm. and again. I'm and that was the interesting thing. When I talked to him earlier today, <clears throat> you know, what he said was, I said, you know, do you make cab? He's like, no, I, I don't make cab. I don't want to make cab. I don't need to make cab. Huh. I'll, I'll try a little bit. If you're willing to share. I'll start with the white right now. Oh, okay. You're just skipping all over the place. Yeah, I don't want to start you on the wrong So thing. did you ever hear the joke, uh, Sonoma's known for wine, Napa's known for auto parts? <laughs> I haven't, no. But yeah, you. there you go. You should use that once in a while. I will. I'll start using that today. Yes, there you go. I, I heard that from a Sonoma winemaker. He did it at a wine dinner once. It was absolutely hilarious. And the people, the people didn't laugh, and then all of a sudden they got it. Because, you know, when you're drunk, you don't really, you yeah. either get it or you just... <laughs> you just don't, and <laughs> right. they got it. But um, I guess how is with with everything going on and and the comp, not competition, but the wines maybe getting better each year. How has your winemaking philosophy changed since when you first started? You know the crazy thing about it; it hasn't changed a lot. I, I still think I, I, I think we kind of view ourselves on the team here. Like I've got an incredible team I've been making wine with now for some of these guys ten years, some of these guys fifteen, sixteen years. They've been with me the whole time. And I think from day one, we've seen ourselves as kind of the stewards of these vineyards in this young region where it's really, since the, we're the first generation going through, it's our job to listen and see what the hell these vineyards can do. And I think we've always been a little bit hands off. I'm not one of those winemakers who's gonna say that the winemaker doesn't play a role in the production. You know, like it's oh, completely non-interventional. It's not that way at all. Winemakers make a huge impact on wine. But I think the way we've always approached it is really just trying to be not to over romanticize it or make ourselves sound like heroes, but like, I don't know, we just listen to the grapes and, you know, try to figure out where the peak ripeness is, try to bring the fruit in, try to understand the tannic structure. And we'll continue to do that year after year after year. But as far as a philosophy for me, oh man, I, I think that I've always viewed it something like this, where we own all our own properties, right? These are all estate vineyards. And that's something we're ferociously proud of because the one thing we do exceptionally well is we farm these properties that are, are, are my boss kind of gave us the right to, to, to care for. And I think we, we farm all year, right? We plant these vineyard blocks, we farm them for four years, we finally get fruit, we farm the hell out of them, they come in, I make the picking decision, we get a knock on the door at four in the morning during harvest, right? And you open the door, there's like this incredible marble statue. It's like perfect, right? It's almost just this ideal, like a stunningly perfect statue. And I think as winemakers, you have, you could do like, like fine grain sandpaper in one hand, or you have a chisel with a giant hammer in the other, right? And you can either take that chisel and hammer and be like, I don't like the shape of it. I didn't want to make a wine like this. I like drinking wines from such and such a region, so I'm going to try to hammer this square peg through a round hole. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hammer it and make a different beautiful statue. And I've had wines that, that people with that philosophy kind of, you know, th that they produce, and I love them. There's incredible wines, incredible examples of, of that but I've always been completely opposite. We're absolutely really fine grain sandpaper folks here. And so if there's an imperfection, if we can make the wine better, if we can take a rough spot out, we'll sand it down. But I'll never take a hammer and chisel and like try to restructure this thing, try to reshape it. And that has never changed. Mm -hmm. I'm also really spoiled to work with vineyards that are just world-class. Like, you know, between the Hilt and Honada, I'm lucky, really lucky. I'm going to go search for some hammers around here. Start looking now. <laughs> Dog toys, forklifts, a couple presses. You got a, you got a uh, dart board in the bathroom. <laughs> oh, yeah, indeed, I, I indeed. thought that was awesome. Oh, know. yeah, yeah. yeah. We should drink heavily and play darts. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be fun. I'll start right now. That'll be fun. So what are, what are, so you said the wine. I mean, did you look at your life now? Did you grow up in Vermont? Kansas City. Kansas City. Yeah, baby. All right. Yeah. All right. I got a question for you. Bryant or, Gate, or uh, Gates? Gates, I know. Um, you know, I like the ribs at Gates. I like the beef sandwich at Bryant's. And I like the fries at Wyandotte 2 Barbecue. I also think LC's is exceptional. 
Um, I grew up, man, I, it's so great to hear that question. Where, where did, what part of Kansas City did you grow up? I grew up uh, Prairie Village. Yep. I I'm like well. on State Line-ish. Prairie Village, really, that's Kansas. Not I, Missouri. No, I grew up on State Line, on the Kansas side. Oh, did side. you? Okay. KC, yeah, yeah Kansas okay. City. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I mean, everybody's all about like, yeah. It was Oklahoma Joe's or whatever. I moved out by the time that came yeah. in. I don't understand it. Gates, baby. Gates, baby. Gates, Gates. is amazing. Gates. So my daughter's, uh, my oldest child's uh, godfather, born and raised Kansas City. Okay, good. Good friend of mine. Went to Rockhurst. Uh, family still lives in, uh, family still lives in Kansas City. You going to drop a name? Uh, Sam Davidson. Hmm. He's younger. He's probably oh, The Kansas 30, City 60. Davidsons. <laughs> uh, it is. Actually, his dad was one of the founding members of the Negro Hall of Fame. No way. Yeah. So no he was, way. Uh, yeah. He was... Um, we, we used to go to it, the fundraiser, the golf fundraiser and stuff like that. Until you've been to the museum. <clears throat> yeah. It's been to, unbelievable. Yeah. It's awesome. It's a really cool part of town, too. Yeah. Yeah, I know kids. We almost moved there. We, we, uh, my wife and I, but when we had our daughter, we were looking to get out of Akron, Ohio. Shocker. Shocker. Uh, not from there. <laughs> it's a great place. Akron's a lovely town. It is. It is. It's lovely. Lovely, yes. lovely this time of year. Okay, that's kind of a <laughs> slap in the face, but okay. I'm uh, from Kansas City, man. Well, I'm Come from on. Canada. <laughs> you know, I said something to my wife. She's like, you're from Canada. It's worse up there. I'm like, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Hey, Mom, how is it? Oh, it's gorgeous. It's minus 50, but the sun's out. Oh, it's stunning. Yeah, it Pure is. sunlight. It is. Yeah, yeah. But I love Kansas City. <laughs> I love Kansas and, and, and I was, you know, cheering for the Chiefs. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. It's a fun city. I've just right? recovered from that yeah. old deal. And you the know, Royals. Yeah, and the Royals, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, we got a 15 yeah. championship. Yeah. And yeah, we got a World Series. Look, I, 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 think, <laughs> I think Kansas City, like, I'm so proud to be from there. Yeah. I'm so proud to be from there. And I think part of my winemaking, oddly enough, right, is driven by being from Kansas yeah. City. In Most the people from Kansas City are very proud to be from Kansas City. Yeah, man. It's, it's a craziest place. thing. Yeah. Well, because the food's off the charts. Good. Yeah. And the people don't. Drew's, care about Drew's anything. Laugh, Drew's laughing off you after. Yeah, I know. It is. Yeah. It is. Sorry, yeah. Fifth, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Jerk. But yeah, yeah. You, who invited him? Yeah, God. But <laughs> the the whole thing to me is like there's there's no there's no pomp and circumstance. It's just really good food. Yeah. People want really good food. Yeah. Not and many they want chains. Really good beer, like Boulevard beer. Like oh. that was that was and yeah. probably still is. But shit, that was a seventh. Was a tank. What's the one? Oh, now? tank seven. All tank that stuff. Seven, but even yeah, when yeah. all they have was the bully porter and yeah. the wheat and the pale ale. I've been to Boulevard Brewery. It's a great place. But everything is, is based on just quality, and there's not yep. a lot of fluff. It's just like, this shit's good. And we like good wine and like good food, and yeah, shit, I'm really proud to be from there. Yeah. Uh, one of my uh, buddies, uh, Sam's really good friend, uh, owns Kelly's. Yeah. That's, oh. that's his father. He runs it now. I've been good there, Kelly. Yeah, oh. you see that? Isn't that great? Man. Drew's getting I didn't jealous. know I was going to <laughs> I didn't know I was going to wake up end up talking about Casey. Yeah. This makes we, me so we happy. Go, we go all over the place going. here. We go all over the place. So what do we, let's talk a little bit about the wine. Um, so we're drinking the Hilt Chardonnay. Yes. Why, why the Hilt? Why is it the Hilt? Is it like from the Shining or? Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> from the Shining. It's good kind of good. a scary name. <laughs> the Hilt. Well, yeah. Yeah. We thought we'd name it after just the most horrifying Hilda, movie you know. ever. No, look, Hilt refers to the fact that we farm exceptionally well right that, that mm -hmm. we farm to the hilt we farm to the ninth the ninth degree that that basically everything we do is driven by our farming perspective and focus on quality uh the chardonnay i mean this the hilt story is a really, really fairly long story but to kind of simplify it the honada is everything but pinot chard right right because it's too warm I and mean, really hot warm days cold nights over in ballard mm -hmm. canyon right out here where we are right now the ocean's only 10 miles away and it's the cold current coming down from mm -hmm. Alaska that we hit here because of the east-west mountain range. And as kind of lovers of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and, and admirers and, and, and people who are incredibly inspired by Burgundy, when we got here and started Honada, we were like, oh, my God, you, you taste what, what Bruno is doing at Sanford Benedict, what, what, what Rick Longori is doing, what all these guys are, the Clendenin are making, you know, these incredible Pinots and Chards in this county. So we fell in love with it and decided to join in. And while we're lovers of Burgundy, we don't want to make Burgundy here, right? This is California. I mean, it's sunny all the time. This is a maritime climate. Burgundy's very much a continental climate. Totally different, totally different characters. And so we jumped in here and just from 2004 until 2014, tried to figure out, like we did our diligence, I guess. We tried to figure out where we wanted to be, what kind of Pinot and Chardonnay we could make here. And we decided we wanted to make a Chardonnay that was based on electricity like freshness, to a shocking degree. You know, uh, a combination of like incredibly energizing electric acid and a real saline streak. Like almost when you eat an oyster and then you forget 
that joyful forgetting where you're like, oh, God, I still have all the nectar in the shell. And you, I don't eat oysters. Thank you. Oh, but see, well, like, I guess I'm out. Peace. Like, like someone's <laughs> talked about a Reese's, piece, Re- Reese's Pieces bar or whatever the hell is. I'm like, dude, I'm allergic to peanut butter. It's like, well, you should try one. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Start with oysters. Yeah. Then I, get into Reese's yeah, Pieces. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. No, no. <laughs> but, that's a good analogy. I get it. I'm just messing with you. Uh, Oh, our, our Pinot's all about Reese's Pieces, so yeah. Okay. Oh, let's, all right, let's pour some of that. I'll just do it myself since you're already past that. Oh, yeah, I'm way past that. I might take a shot, though, if you can. Okay. But so, so the Chardonnay, about electricity, about kind of, uh, um, again, that shocking, piercing purity. With Pinot Noir, we were looking for a site, after buying fruit from all over the Santa Rita Hills, we were looking for a site that gave us... Oh, Yes. I've never been a part of filming a spillboard. <laughs> I've always wanted to see what it looks like in slow motion. Can we slow that down and see it again? No, let's not. <laughs> right, that's good. We'll get a straw for you. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's going to get me like one new YouTube subscriber. <laughs> what were we talking about? Reese's Pieces? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> but, but with Pinot, we were looking for something I like to call the hint of corruption, right? Right, like it has to have something that sets a hook. Mm-hmm. It can't be sugar and spice and everything nice. It has to have gaminess, uh, uh, um, complexity, and, and like a, a kind of a sensual note to it. It like makes you want to like drop a glass and shit, yet, right? Yeah, something that makes you break the glass out. though, and that's a that's a thinny skin. And that's a Zalto. I Those know. break when you look at them funny. I better not look at them. That's really nice. Both the wines are very nice. Yeah, I think I think we found our home though, right? We found uh, this three thousand six hundred acre property where we are now, which is called. Salsi yep. It's now called the Hilt Estate, but in Spanish that means get the hell out if you can. And it's just a really mean, evil little spot. Yeah. It's windy, it's cold. It's I always joke around saying that if we got out of the great business, we could get into the poison oak and rattlesnake business. Wonderful. Yeah. Which make is a lot less lucrative. You can make a lot of a lot, a lot of money in that. <laughs> Might get bit. Yeah. Do you find that uh, I feel like, you know, with, with producers in certain regions, like here that it's known for Pinot and stuff like that, they're Pinot producers. Mm-hmm. But I find with you, you dabble in a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And is it because of your surroundings and, and where you are, or is it just something you're kind of passionate about doing different stuff? You know, I, th- I think, you know, the first ones that really turned me on were, were Cabernet based. Um, you know, uh, Cabernet Merlot, I, it was really Bordeaux back mm-hmm. When like even like the 89 and 90 vintage weren't that expensive. You know, you could actually buy those exquisite, like ground, like incredible vintages. Um, and that's what I fell in love with. And then I went to like, <laughs> went to Vermont and was making like Zweigelt and <laughs> Cayuga and Vignol and Chardonnay. I, I love a good uh, Cayuga. When's the last time you had a good Traminette? Last night, actually. <laughs> Chamberson, <laughs> yeah. But so I did all of that. And then I went to Napa and was back in the world of Cab. And then I went to New Zealand, which was, you know, Doug was making yep. with AB. They were making Chard and Pinot and Syrah and Cab and all these things. Yep. And so I bounced around and saw it all. But in my heart, I was always a Cab person. Mm-hmm. I was always a Bordeaux person. And came down to Santa Barbara County, and I'd be like, who wants to open a Cab? And it was like crickets. Yeah. You know, I was in a blind tasting group for, and still am. It's been 17 years now. I think there was one tasting based on Cab. <laughs> I was like, yes, it's happened. I'm here. <laughs> but I think I've taken a lot of my my background in cab and, and actually brought it to Chardonnay and Pinot, which at their base, I mean, when you look at it, people who really focus is like that Burgundy is the home of Chardonnay and Pinot. Mm-hmm. You can't argue with that. But people then are like, it has to be a wine that's specifically about place. Yes. But to me, I always struggle back and forth with that, that what is wine at its really at its, in its roots is, is pleasure. It has to be delicious. Mm -hmm. And so I love that we have these vineyards out here. We have Radian and Bent Rock, and we can blend them. We can do single vineyards as well, but kind of like when you're blending Merlot and Cab Sav and Cab Franc and Petit Ferdot, I want to make a wine that's complete and balanced. Mm -hmm. And we take like the really shrill, tense, dark brooding fruit from Radian, and we blend it with like the rounder, more supple kind of blood orange qualities of the Pinot from Bent Rock, and they're really cool on their own. Interesting, fascinating, almost, you have to think about them, you know? They're intellectual wines. And when you put them together, they're the kind of wines you want to drink bottle after bottle right. after bottle because it's delicious. It's just, it feels right. Yeah, I'm going to drink that off the table. Yeah, and, and we're going to get a sponge out yeah. when you leave and we're going to put it back in. Who says we're going to take a sponge? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with uh, Matt Dees. 
All right, so we're back with Matt Dees. Let's try. Um, let's try the next one. Okay, we can do that. Just spill it on the table. <laughs> Smart ass. I have a feeling I'm never going to live this shit down. <laughs> it's all right, man. I got the tow motor. I'll just run you over with it. So I got a funny story about a tow motor. So I started this wine distributor about 11 years ago. Don't know what the hell he was doing. So this guy delivers a pallet of wine to me. It's the first ever pallet I get. I'm all excited. You know, this guy, truck driver comes and stuff like that. And he says, uh, so what are you going to take it off with? I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, you don't have a tow motor? I'm like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so literally the next day, well, I knew I was getting another shipment a week from now, week that Tuesday. So I go and buy, you know, $2,600, 19, you know, 48 tow motor. You know, the <laughs> wheels are great. You know, I'm not going to use it much, so I get it. So the guy's all excited because he helped me take the 56 cases off. So he comes back the next week. He's all excited. He sees his tow motor. He's like, all right, let's go. He says, well, I don't know how to drive it. <laughs> so he tries to show me, and I hit the <laughs> crap out of the back of his semi, and he's like, it's all good. It's all good. I still don't know how to drive stick. But, uh, no? Mm-mm. Oh, man. So tell me about this one. This is the pairing or the parring? The pairing, we prefer. But there's no I in it, though. Is it where you in Canada or here? Yeah, there is no I. You're right. It is misspelled as far as a pairing of food and wine. Yes. It is correctly spelled for the knife. Mm, right? Interesting. The one knife every chef needs. You that's need a, a good p- pairing knife. That's right? a par- you it's, no, it's, a par- it's a parry knife. Is it a parry? Oh, God, you I are Canadian. <laughs> Canadian? Queen's English. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll figure that out by the end. But, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, this was a brand we started. Like I said before, like the the... the beauty of of this production is that we own these two properties the hilton Mm -hmm. estate and the honada estate and then we decided to come out with this blend back in 2005 which actually was a way to thank restaurants that have been supporting our 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 kind of fledgling brand at that time and it was a by the glass pour so it was a little bit more open a little bit less structured a little bit more pop and pour and we decided to call the pairing kind of a tip of the hat to the pairing of food and wine but also the kitchen with the chef's knife or Mm -hmm. with the pairing knife sorry uh, and it, it kind of grew and, you know, it, it, it's changed a little bit, but it's always kind of represented the best of California cab to me, mm-hmm. where you get a lot of, of Southern California kind of, um, uh, they're actually really structured wines here off our property, off our estate, and they're very fresh. There's really actually very high acid. And then we bring in some fruit or some wine from Northern California, a couple of vineyards up there that are really kind of based on that broad, generous, kind of wonderful sweet fruit. Cool. Yeah, it's a ripping wine. I love it. I think it always over delivers. You can age it. Like the 05 finally opened up like a year ago, you know, and it was mm-hmm. a $25 bottle. Uh, anyways, it's drinking well today. I, I'm, I'm really proud of that wine. Yeah. Looked better on the table, but it's better in my glass, I guess. It looked better on the table than the Pinot, to be fair. Yeah, it'd be darker. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some of your wines, you have like two, like the, uh, what's it, Long La Sangre? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you use 2% Viognier. Mm-hmm. Is that something you picked up from New Zealand, or is that just something? Yeah, I mean, we picked that up from, like, Koroti, and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the reason they do it is very different than the reason we do it. And I, it's really funny. I actually like using Viognier because I like the stems. And it's not like we blend it back. It's co-fermented. Right, okay. so it's not like, no. it's not like we we take a white barrel and right, put, right, put a couple right, drops right. in, like five gallons in. We we use the grapes actually, the whole cluster from Viognier because the stems are incredibly green, like green peppercorn. They're really lovely and aromatic and floral. Mm-hmm. And I've been known to actually take the grapes off the stems of the Viognier and just throw the, the stems in because Viognier stems are worth their weight in gold. I love them. Um, but you know, I think one thing that highlights for us is that. We're really not dogmatic in anything, and, and we change from year to year, and we respect the fact that we're a young region and, and, and fairly young producer. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we've been known to, to be open to changing our minds on things really rapidly. And the sangre, as far as the 2% Viognier, changes from year to year, and some years if the stems are great, we'll do it. If other years are terrible, we won't touch Viognier. Um, but it makes a difference. It lifts it. it. It takes a wine that can otherwise be very brooding and kind of dark and dense and, and makes it a little more fresh, I'd mm-hmm. say, a little more floral. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. And then how do you guys come up with the names for like Todos and Blood's Devil and Devil's Blood and Pig's Head and all this stuff, the different, <laughs> different wines? Yeah. Pig's Head. Pig's Head was hard to come up with. Yeah. Um, 
You know, it's actually really funny. So we we spent a really long time back in the like primeval days, like back in 2004, five and six, beating our head against a wall with what the hell to call this brand. Mm -hmm. um, because the story isn't really about anybody. The story is really about the place. Um, it's I, I mean, having named two children with my wife, it's you, far you, easier you didn't to name, name them. You just agreed. Let's be honest. Uh, yeah, you're right. But I agreed. Yeah. <laughs> That's 10% um, of the battle. 100% <laughs> of the, the correctness, 10% of the battle. I'll give you that. Yeah. I'll give you 15. What are your kids' names? Harper and August. Okay, that's good. I did okay, right? Yeah. I okayed two relatively yeah. good names. It's better than like uh, my um, mother-in-law. My wife's whole family's in medicine, and, and my mother-in-law comes home one year. This is probably not HIPAA laws. I'm, I'm sure it was out. And her, <laughs> the girl, this woman named their daughter La. So the letter L with a dash it was Ladasha. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Isn't that great? Wait, Ladash A? L I, I dash know. A? I think it was L A dash Ladasha. Oh. And maybe awesome. there's an A on it, yeah. I think Ladasha Taylor would be a pretty name. I say pretty, but that's a yeah, beautiful name. It is. Michael Harper over that. It's close. Yeah, it's close. Yeah. Harper August Ladasha. <laughs> that's Harper, pretty sorry. awesome. Yeah, I know. It'd be great. But, <laughs> but like you can name, you can name a, you can name a child and like they kind of grow into it and it makes sense and it feels great. And you're like, we did it right. Wine's harder to name. And yeah. It's, it, Isn't that funny though? It's just, it makes no sense. Well, because I think when you, when you name a child, we didn't name our daughter for a couple days because we we're kind of thinking, and then we named her Lily and it just sits. With a wine, it's a great name. you don't, you don't, it doesn't, I mean, there's really not a personality or, or a, a living being mm -hmm. to it. Um, so how do you, you know, how do you name it and stuff like that? So, you know, to, to be candid, we, we hired a firm back in the, again, the primeval days, like back mm -hmm. in the, the old days. And they came down, this gentleman came down and basically charged us a fair amount of money sure. and presented us with a couple of sheets. I still have them upstairs. And I remember he came into his, for his presentation, we were sitting there and the first thing he said, it was like a bad joke. He said, how do you feel about Greek mythology? <laughs> like, I feel fairly dubious of Greek mythology yeah. to be fair. He's like, well, how do you feel about equestrian names? I was like, do I look like I ride horses? <laughs> and how do you feel about like just awful, yeah. awful, awful yeah. names? And so we Zeus. basically, we, yeah, the That's beard of Zeus. Name. The beard of Zeus. Yeah. The beard but we basically picked him up and threw him out the door. And we sat down and had kind of a come to Jesus moment where I was like, we got to figure out a name. What are we missing? It's right in front of us. We need to figure this out. And we looked at an old map and the land grant was called back from 1842. It was sold to two Mexican brothers and it was called uh, Rancho San Carlos de Hanata. And so we're like, oh shit, there it is, Hanata. And because the story really is about that special parcel mm -hmm. of land. The names, as far as using Spanish names, I mean, this is New Spain, right? right. Historically, Santa Barbara, this all of Canada, or California, Southern right. California especially. Um, and the names just stuck. I mean, mm -hmm. Cabernet Franc with all of its soulfulness is El Alma, the soul, right? El Desafio, the Cabernet Sauvignon is the defiance. It's kind of our thank you to everybody who told us to grow asparagus instead of grapes, you know? And La Sangre, the blood, it, it makes sense for Sarai. It's the sanguine kind of yeah, ferrous, very earthy, bloody wine. Does the owner grow asparagus anywhere in all We do properties? grow asparagus, yes. Really? Yeah, we grow great asparagus. Nice. Just to kind of okay. thumb our nose at all yeah, our that's friends cool. over across the pond. There you go. <laughs> it's true. It's good. <laughs> really? I should have brought some to serve it to you. Yes. Now, we raise chickens and turkeys and sheep and goat and hogs and... Uh, asparagus. Aspar we raise yes. asparagus lovingly. Nice. nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's your favorite uh, thing you grow here other than grapes? Ooh, other than grapes. I love sheep milk. I love sheep milk cheese. We make sheep milk ricotta. We have a herd of about probably 40 uh, sheep and lamb right now and about 120 goat and cabrito. Wow. Um, I love Cabrito as well. I love Do you eating. Name them? You name, name <laughs> them? Like the, uh... my, my wife named, we, we raise hogs, and she named two of the hogs um, after her mother and her aunt. Porky. It's the last, like last time she named what, any what, animals. What did she name? What were their names? <laughs> it was Loey and Louise, and she named them after her aunt and mother. And we, I remember at the harvest party one year, it was like, what happened to Loey and Louise? Yeah, you're eating them. <laughs> yeah, it was an awful moment. <laughs> So we don't name, we don't name the hogs anymore, but the goat and sheep herd, you know, they're really, it's basically lawn mowing and fire protection, yeah. you know, cause they will eat their way through the entire ranch. Mm -hmm. Um, and so 
they actually belong to the team. They don't, you know, every every team member, every vineyard man, uh, vineyard team member, and winery team member owns a huge portion of them. Really? Yeah, and you can harvest for your family, whatever you want to do. Really? Yeah. So, what kind of lifespan do they have before you harvest them for your family per se? Oh man, this is some dark stuff. <laughs> well, no, it's, just, it's a good question. I mean, I know it's 2021 and we probably have uh, no, animal no, no. rights listening to well, it. Well, no, I mean, no, no. I mean, I, I think, look, when we, we, we started to diversify and, and, and really focus on, on environmental sustainability, right? Farming sustainably. And at the same time, we introduced this process of, of bringing animals back into the farm product or back into the farm system. And part of that was let's look at actually social responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. We work with a team, like all our team members here have been with, most of them have been here for 10, 15 years. And we took ownership of it and we gave them ownership of it where it was mm-hmm. for like $20 for the cost to buy a cabrito, uh, you know, a female. You could just buy them, tag them, and they're part of our herd forever. And when they have cabrito, the males get tagged with your family's number. And if you want to harvest them for meat, the males, you can. The females become part of the herd and get your tag, and it perpetuates, and it goes on. Now Isn't we it have amazing how they, they get rid of the male? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. It is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's life. The praying life. man is, you know. It's hard. Exactly. All right, so what's the, what's the last one? Did we do the Honada yet, uh, Todos? We did not. All right, let's do that one, and then we'll... Uh, We'll talk more Kansas City barbecue. Oh, God. God, can you imagine barbecue with us? Uh, I can, actually. I've always said if I could get my wine on the list at Gates Barbecue, like if you walked in and it was like you can get Boulevard Pale Ale. Yep. You could get um, – there's a strawberry soda. I think it's Fanta. Uh, there's a 7-Up or Sprite. I don't remember if it's Coca-Cola House or not. And there's a root beer. And then it was like and Honata Totos. I might retire and move to Mexico. I might be like, that's it. I've yeah. achieved my yeah. goal in life. Like I'll have a short end, fries, a yummy yammer pie, and a totos. I'd, I'd be the happiest kid in the world. Oof. So is this the is this considered the flagship? In some ways, yeah. I mean, it's it, the workhorse, right? Yeah, in the sense that 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 it represents everything we do, right? If if someone were to ask me, uh, you know, what do you do at Honada? I would say we do this. It's every grape we grow. It's, it's the more hedonistic side of the vineyard. I mean, that's a rather hedonistic wine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little bit more rich, a little more dense, a little more fruit-driven. Uh, it's not quite as structurally intense, monstrous, you know, in some of our other wines. It's our biggest production, and it's probably what we're the most proud of. Yeah, it's, it actually came about in a really funny way, right? We, in 2004 and five, we took all of our grapes. Uh, it was 11 grapes at that time. And we sat down at a table and we said, let's listen to these grapes and see what has a voice loud enough, like demanding a bottling, right? Sangiovese did, Cabernet Franc did, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon did, Syrah did, Sauvignon Blanc did. And we kept taking these wines off the table. And at the end of the tasting of the 10 wines that had been my favorites, eight of them were still on the table because they didn't necessarily speak of a variety. They spoke of the place. And so as a joke, with 04, we said, why don't we just put them together? And it worked. And then from 05 on, it became a wine of intent and focus. And we left some blocks out longer. We dried grapes, like uh, Recioto style. We uh, co-fermented some really wild things together. And it became this exotic, kind of beautiful <coughs> expression of our property. Yeah. It's cool, isn't it? It's nice. Yeah. It's got some, you can even lay it down a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just getting started. How long do you think that that would last for? I can only speak... From experience, like, you know, I I love when I hear my peers who have been in the industry for even less time than I, like, that's a 50 year wine. Like you've been making wine for four. (laughs) Give me a break. I I can tell you the 04 is beautiful today and that is 16 years old. So I bet you this 16 will be at its peak in 10 years and hold its peak for 15 and then be something interesting and tertiary for five more years. Yeah, at it's, least it's amazing because you see these like these tasty notes with some of these wine spectators, wine enthusiasts, or you know even the wineries. They say best after two thousand and thirty-eight. Yeah, and I once asked a winery that's been in the wine business in Napa for forty years, mm-hmm. and I said, "How can you you tell?" It's like, man, we've been ta- we're tasting Chardonnays now twenty years ago, and they're still drinking beautifully. Yeah. 
The stony, the stony hills of the world should well, be the authorities right. in that. Right. Like, yeah. Or right. the, you know. or your friend that's been in, in the wine business for four years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? It's so ridiculous. Yeah. It's like that. Now that's a 50 year wine. I'm like, dude, you're 31. Yeah. You never know. Let's try it at 81. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, this is a 77 year <laughs> wine right here. Oh, God, the next time the Royals win the world series. You never know. might be a 50 years. Um, but, uh, Matt, I want to thank you so much. We're going to do a little, uh, stick with us. We're going to do a little, uh, bonus content with, uh, Matt D's appreciate you uh having me and uh, i apologize for um spilling the wine on the table well, you'll live it down someday i will or when, uh, when the browns win the super bowl yeah they're getting there they're getting there <laughs> yeah. they're getting there <laughs>